And if you look close enough, I think there might have been a little bit of uh, revenge on the Oompa Loompa, but I don't know if that's the one I'm thinking of. It is, it is. Bob's even in there this week. At any rate, the, the movie Willy Wonka introduces us to a set of characters called the Oompa Loompas. And they remind us in that whole story, they're a little bit of their own story themselves. They were on an island where they were taunted by wild beasts that threatened to eat them. A kind man by the name of Willy Wonka takes them to his factory where they live. They're devoted to him to make candy. And as we know, it's candy that's so sweet that it makes the world taste good. Well, the thing about these Oompa Loompas, too, is not only their size or their oranges appearance, but they seem to have words of wisdom that they offer from time to time. At least in the story itself, those songs that they sing when we begin to discover some of the characters that come alive within the story itself. They remind us of such uh, elements within our own society of being uh, too obsessed with things like television or belongings of some sort or another, wanting too much, mass consumption, consumerism, all of the like. And if you think about the story itself, if it were put within the context of the genre of, of a Greek story, in Greek theater itself, the Oompa Loompas come across really very much like the chorus within the story. They keep coming up every once in a while to remind us of really the values of the society, of the culture, the morals that they're trying to portray and to get across. So as we review, as we review a little bit from last week, we wanted to do a, a two-week exploration here on Oompa Loompa faith, asking last week, what's in it for me? We started to hear to get a glimpse in the, the notion of what greed is, at least through the eyes of the Oompa Loompas. And scripturally speaking, we were also challenged to, to use our imaginations. That when we use our imaginations for God, we, we begin to understand the kingdom of God that's before us. That within God's imagination, all things are possible. It is through the sake of God's kingdom to come of something that's not just, you know, there in the future, but it's here with us now. So within God's kingdom, we do a parallel between the sayings of the Oompa to the parables of Jesus Christ, those, those words that challenge us to be listeners with our ears and to have eyes to see. Ultimately, it's those words that challenge us that would lead to a, a transformation in our lives, hopefully to make us a better person. Now, although it was mentioned last week, our exploration into the scripture passage last Sunday and today fall into a series of passages that Jesus talked a lot about when he came to the kingdom of God. And he used phrases like this, the kingdom of God is like this, or get ready, be prepared, look out. He was trying to get people's attention to say that the kingdom of God is before you now in the very midst. When John the Baptist said that the kingdom of God is among you and he saw Jesus coming down to be baptized, he wasn't saying that on such and such date the kingdom's going to appear. That in Jesus' presence there and now the kingdom is before you. Jesus continued that theme as he began talking about the kingdom of God as something that's not to, to come in the future, but is here in the now, in the present, and something in which we partake in together. It's in these kingdom teachings that Jesus also begins to warn people about behavior, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, what a person is to be accountable for when they're in the kingdom of God. I suspect as our children and youth are returning back to school the last couple weeks and still even this week, the teachers are sitting down with them. I'm sure Jeff does this with the choir, you know, when we start a new season. There are some rules. This is how you're going to behave if you're going to sit into that desk. This is what's expected of you. Treat people nice. Don't hit each other. Don't laugh at me when I should be laughed at. Those sorts of things being held accountable in that very respect. Jesus was saying, I'm holding you accountable. And within that very fashion there, that accounting is something within Jesus' day that he said, there's some acceptable, unacceptable behaviors when it comes to the kingdom of God. And one of those certain behaviors had to do with greed. We 
talked about greed a little bit last week. We heard how greed is really this sense of, of having an excessive desire for more. Give me, give me, give me. Although I wouldn't mind seeing a nice little red Porsche in the parking lot with my name on it if you want to make that happen. So, uh, But it is that whole sense of that excessiveness of wanting more, that over time the effects that we of greed can accumulate in our own lives here and really consume who we are. It clouds our, our vision, our perspective of how we treat people, how we even look at ourselves. And we focused on this parable that Jesus tells about this, this rich farmer who acquires everything that he can and even stores up. And in his retirement, he lives pretty fat on his, his retirement there, eating, drinking, and being merry. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the challenge of that passage really was is if you got something with that, there comes some expectations. And what could you do with that? You, know, you read last week a little flyer insert in your bulletin there that talked about a two thousand dollar challenge that we've been re that we've received as a church. If you were given two thousand dollars today, what would you do with it? Pay some bills, uh, have a nice dinner, go on a cruise. We as a church have been given a challenge of two thousand dollars to ignite a new ministry to set something on fire in the lives of people that they are reminded that they too are a part of the kingdom of God. It's to be reminded not of the greedy things that we can do with it, but the generous things that are before us. You see, it's important for us to understand that greed doesn't have everything to do with money or wealth or who dies with the most toys. You see, there are many faces to greed. You see, for example, we can think of greed that's a, a form of different personalities. Greed is that horn that's honking behind you because you stop at a yellow light rather than speeding through the intersection. Greed is also that phone that rings during the movie in the movie theater. Never rings in church, right? <laughs> greed is also that very perspective that, oh, that's someone else's job to pick up the trash off the ground. Greed is also that perspective that says it's someone else's duty to take care of that child or that woman or that man or the family that's holding a sign on the corner of the street that says, you know, I'm hungry. Greed has many different faces and it's more than just what we put in our pocket or what we hang on our walls. You see, there's a prophetic face to greed as well. A face that tells us what we are accountable for. You see, greed can also remind us that there is enough food to feed those who are hungry. That there are enough closets that are bursting open to clothe the naked. That there's enough compassion within the body of Christ to go to visit those who are homeless or in prison. That there is enough that can burst forth to quench the lives of thirsty souls. Greed has many different faces, comes in many forms, and looks a little bit differently and calls us to do certain things. Always, though, it seems as if we get caught up in greed, though, we do get caught up in the perspective of, it's all about me. It's all about me, whatever I want. And we, we get this preoccupation of oneself when it comes to greed that the world revolves around me. It's all about me, and from last week's parable of the rich fool, Jesus talks about this, this farmer here, and God calling him out in the middle of the night of his unfortunateness and saying, your soul is mine because you didn't do anything with what you had. You see, it's easy for us to get caught up in a literal reading of that passage of how there comes a quick death for those persons who are greedy, or at least for this rich fool. It's an approach that's nice, it's neat, it's, it's clean, and we can just read for it in its black and white perspective. It causes us to, to consider the goodness of our own hearts and to know that there are plenty of good hearts that are out there. But for us who are unable to walk away from this passage or from God's requiring the soul of the rich fool, there, there is something more to it. 
better understanding of this passage from last week is one's devotion and dedication when it comes to the livelihood of God. That God doesn't have time to be some junk collector of our stuff. Rather, God has time to receive people who are perfect, perfect in their own way by investing in the things of God's kingdom. Which brings us to our message this morning, what's in it for God? What did God sign up for? Just exactly what is God looking for in us as people of faith? Well, this whole idea of this about me might make us feel uncomfortable and, and squirm in our seats. And, and yeah, you know, someone might say, I, you know, I came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict those who are comfortable. But there is some hope. There is a reward in those who are faithful. You see, if we're to consider this voice that lies behind this message this morning, we hear God's voice and God's Spirit say to us, I need you to want what I need. And as we begin to connect that message with what God is trying to tell us, we realize that it's not about us, but it's about God. That God wants nothing more than to be our God and for us to be God's people. See, God seeks a relationship with us that's far greater than the, the bond of friendship. And as we read from this passage this morning, that bond that God desires with us is really revealed through that metaphor of marriage. God wants to be in that sense of connection that we experience in a marriage. And so we have this image here this morning of a marriage that happens, this this final consummation of God's kingdom, if we want to use some fancy, tricky theological language there, that we're called as the people of God to, to be in communion with God. This isn't something that's an, an outcome of the future, as I had said just a moment ago, but it's something about the presence of God's kingdom that is here today as we live out as the body of Christ. So our gospel reading this morning depicts what the expectations are and anticipation of experiencing the kingdom of God that's before us. And, and so Jesus talks about a wedding. Now we don't want to get confused here because we don't know what weddings look like in Jesus' day. We do know, though, it probably would have been pretty insulting back in Jesus' day, though, to think of a wedding as this afternoon event with the reception to follow. You see, in Jesus' day, a wedding went on for like, you know, a week. It's like a Tongan wedding, if you've ever been to one of those things. I mean, you pack a suitcase with your clothes, you pack a cooler full of food, and then you bring the, the toaster oven that you're going to give to the bride and groom. Weddings were an event. We also need to understand the role of servants in Jesus' day. There was a sense of dedication that came from servants to their masters, not like the perspective we have in our American history when it comes to servants. Servants were dedicated in such a way that when the master was away, the business of the house still kept going on it's as if the master was there. So as the master goes on his or her honeymoon, it should be expected and anticipated upon that the master would return at some point, whether it be late at night or someday down the road. They shouldn't be slouchy and sure. The servants that had not kept the house up would experience some sort of consequence where those who kept the house up, who remained devoted to the master, would experience something very much like an honored guest, someone treated like a king or a queen, or what did that guy say a few weeks ago, like an angel. The master would return and receive them and say, sit at my seat, let me wait on you. For truly this has a house that we share together. So what's the outcome of this text? Where is the punchline to any of it here? Well, Jesus teaches us, us that the desire of God is really to give us what God has in the first place. And that's God's kingdom. When we get to the conclusion of the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, we finally learn what, what Willy Wonka's desire is. He wants to give his kingdom away to someone special. 
someone who's dedicated, who understands. And throughout the whole story, we kind of know that that's what's going to happen. Someone's going to get a supply of chocolate, but Willy Wonka wants to, to give him a little bit more than just a supply of chocolate. He wants to give him the kingdom. And it's through the very act of kindness, the very act of generosity, that Charlie Bucket extends to him, I already have what I need in my world. Keep your kingdom, that the kingdom unfolds, and Charlie receives the award that is presented to him. I invite you to see that now. Mr. Wonka? So shines a good deed in a weary world. Charlie! Experience what God wants for us, 
what God has for us, and what God offers for us so that all may live a happily life ever after. Let the people sing. Amen. Amen.